Hello, hello. Yep, so good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone here at this session. And we have a wonderful panel of speakers here talking about storytelling for climate action. And this session is hosted by four different organizations. So firstly, we have Climates. Secondly, we have Digital Storytellers. We also have Climate Kicks. And we also have the we also have the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander International Engagement Organizations. And I'll be your moderator for the day. I am Z Ray, and I'm representing Climates. So today is the ACE Day at the Capacity Building Hub. And the focus of ACE, which stands for Action for Climate Empowerment, is all about learning how everyone in society can engage in climate action. So we hope after today's session that we can amplify your awareness and experience for solving global climate issues and we can inspire you to mobilize social resources for solving uh, global climate issues. Together we can empower you with hands-on skills for telling effective climate stories and finally we can motivate you, especially the youth in here and people coming from indigenous background to proactively engage in decision-making process for climate action. So without further ado, I'll introduce the panel speakers. And first up, we have Jack Collard, who is the director for, of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander International Engagement Organization. This is an organization for indigenous, uh, for building as an indigenous organization dedicated to the building of positive international partnership for the First Nation people in Australia. And he will tell us all about indigenous people's knowledge on climate action. So welcome, Jack. Yabaya <laughs> Nija da bala pin walking in the bala karajin nija boja. Kaya wa bala pin burnanga karajin. Hello, my name is Jack Collard, and I'm a proud Nyunga man with cultural and ancestral ties to the Wajak and the Baladong nations, the ba what, clans of the Nyunga nation. The language that I was speaking was the Wajak. The Wajak language, one of the oldest languages in the world. And what I said in that language was that I've come a very long way. And the path that I've walked to get here, to stand here and to talk to you in that language, is a path carved by my old people. The same paths that they carved as they walked on that country, as they moved with the seasons, and as they walked, they cared for that country and they made it the beautiful country that it is today. With every step, their jenna, their feet left an impression. With every song, they left an impression in our hearts and in our minds. For these songs that they sing, these songs that I still sing to this day, they tell me how I must be. And these lessons tell us that we, as the Nyunga, as the people, we were given the responsibility to be the Mundanga Karajin, the carers of everything. For we have these two hands to care for country, to fight for country. We have this da, we have these tongues to advocate for country. We are obligated to all of these ancestors. We are obligated to all the spirits of all the trees, the Burana. We are obligated to all the spirits 
in the land or the ancestors that have ever been. We are obligated to the wagal, the rainbow serpent that brings the good water that nourishes our country. We see every ripple in every water cycle from the river, the bilia. In Yunga, this has two meanings. It means river, it means the umbilical cord. And then as it makes its way out to the farther ocean, the Mumbakurt, the Waradan, and then it makes its way back up to the Warlabilia, the Sky River, and that cycle goes on and on. This is the lens that we, as the Mundanga Karajan, we look at the world. We are the people that remain connected despite every attempt to disconnect us in this world of disconnection. That is what culture is about. In our language, the word for culture is karajan. Karajan. There's a couple interpretations of this. One being the kart, your head. The jen, your feet. One interpretation is that everything that you absorb in your kart informs every step that your jenna takes. Another interpretation of this is that you talk the talk and then you walk the walk, and that is what we as Indigenous people continue to do. We represent 4% of the world's population, yet we protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. This is a fact you can't argue with, and this is because of the way we look at the world. I'm painted up like this because this is representative of my brunga, my totem, my relative. The southern Bubuk owl, he is me, I am him, and he protects me as I protect him. We look at the world in the context of the seven generations. Us right here, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. We look at the world in this perspective because this is the only way you can look at the world and be sustainable. As the oldest living culture in the world, this was not by accident. It was an intention with every story told, every song sung and every dance danced. Every sacrifice we've ever made is to make the country the way that it is. We are here. I am here. I've flown 39 hours it took me to get here. And we are here not to support the adaptations that have been proposed. We are here as the voices of truth because we are the grassroots people as we are connected to the roots. The word for country in Yunga is Buja. The word to be pregnant is Bujari. And that is because we come from the land. We are products of our environment. In the last 200, 300, 400 years, look at what the world has done as this environment has changed. The cultural environment has changed and the physical environment has suffered. And that is why we as indigenous peoples of the world, the connected people, we come here to remind you how far you have strayed. We come here with love in our hearts and we speak from these hearts and we try and show you the paths that you should be walking, which is the Mundanga Karajan path, not this Nyiriang path, not this Western path of exploitation, extraction and greed, but the path in which everything is cared for, from the bees to the trees to the ants. This is why we are here. We are connected to the problem and we are connected to the solutions. Greta Thunberg, she has got all of the acclaim, all of the media attention, and everybody has heralded her as a champion. We as Indigenous people have been fighting for land. We have been the original environmentalists since day dot. Greta Thunberg is disconnected. She's been advocated that uranium is needed for this just transition. This just transition that has been fast forwarded by Western governments. Western governments that are grounded in these values of greed, exploitation and extraction. They see this as a money-making opportunity. You walk through these halls and you see these people making these business deals. 
All you see is businessmen looking for their way to make money on these carbon markets, but we as Indigenous peoples are saying we don't want carbon markets. This is just a greenwashing scam. 833 cases in recent years have shown Indigenous peoples being subjected to physical assaults, sexual assaults, incarceration of false premises indefinitely because we are fighting for our sovereign lands and these corporations, these governments, they want to take our land so that they can run their scams and do as little as they can to get by without shifting the status quo. But we are not the beneficiaries of the status quo. We are the undiluted truths. And we come here year in, year out to speak these truths in hopes that these, these words from our hearts speak to your hearts. Because our teachings tell us that it was not very long ago that we were all connected to this land. When we were once spirit children roaming these lands before we found our physical bodies, we were all of this land. And we have hope that you will once again remember. And if we don't, if you don't listen to us, then we will together watch the world burn. Ngalaking dapat ang mga woma mga jana ng nungok ni ja ni. Thank you, thank you so much, Jack. So next, we have three speakers from all across the world, but they all belong to an association called Climates, which is an international youth think and do tank which aims to find innovative solution against climate change and gather the next generation of decision makers. Climates has more than 150 passionate young people in over 30 countries that are highly qualified in the subject matter and trains them to address and anticipate emerging climate change issues. So first up, we have Monica, who is the president of Climates Nepal and she'll be telling us about climate stories in the past. Um, thank you so much, Jack. So. Um. Hello everyone, um, my name is Monica. I'm um, from Climates Nepal. Um, and today here I'm representing Climates, uh, so let's begin. So um, talking about Climates Nepal, it is a youth-led organization where we, uh, youth from Nepal work as a network um, to do you know, different activities related to climate awareness through different you know, research activities, through activism, through uh, different creating through momentum. And currently we are operating uh, as a chapter branch of Climates International and we also have different other uh, chapters in different cities which is uh, currently existing in Lamjung and Paklihawa. But uh, we are like working, we promote um, about, you know, action for loss and damage, adaptation, innovation, um, you know, um, about food and agriculture, nutrition, and we also try to promote indigenous practices, uh, sustainable practices, and protect biodiversity and indigenous rights. And how we do this, talking about this, like we do it through the different research activities, like provide, you know, capacity building uh, trainings, you know, knowledge materials, toolkits to different youth who are interested to get engaged with climate activism and environmental education. And also, um, apart from that, we are working as an advocacy momentum. We create different strikes, you know, uh, different um, protests um, in the country to uh, achieve all the, um, you know, policies and climate friendly policies and um, so far like what we are doing to achieve all these act, um, work that we are do, uh, currently working on is that we did a climate action simulation game which is a role playing game where um, you, you know youth from youth like act as different stakeholders from maybe uh, it from government bodies, maybe the uh, uh, business sectors, and maybe students. Like the, it is a role-playing game that we did um, in 30th of April of 2020. Like uh, it was also held um, 
on the occasion of uh, Environment Day and um, a, a total of 35 people showed up and we also raised an awareness about how we can limit uh, our global temperature, like we can uh, minimize the tem like temperature rise and we achieved that we can through our individual actions, through our like by role playing all these games, like through our individual action by different uh, if different stakeholders act, how we can limit um, our global temperature rise by uh, uh, like in coming decades. So we achieved the result of 1.8 degrees Celsius, um, and also uh, apart from that, we also like promote you know sustainable food practices. We also uh, distributed uh, some um, food which we which was about to go to the waste uh, from the event itself. So we distributed it to uh, people who were uh, like deprived of food. Um, and moving on, we also did a local conference of youth in Nepal, which was the first uh, local Elkoi in Nepal that we organized. And we also tried to raise awareness through different uh, infographics. We also tried to raise awareness about different biodiversity loss that we are existing. We uh, like different um, record different data. We do some uh, scientific. Uh, data collections and analysis. Also, um, uh, we we organized this Elkoi event where we invited different uh, people, different experts from um, Nepal who are actively working and who in uh, sectors such as research, such as biodiversity. And moving on, we also um, have uh, different artwork. We also promote um, art uh, work which is called uh, Climate Act. Solidarity, where we invited children and youth to share us their stories about day-to-day -day basis stories that they uh, see on their day-to-day -day life. About it can be about anything, like maybe culture, maybe um, about biodiversity, about the ways that they see. And we promote, you know, engagement of youth through uh, such activities so far. And we also do the, these climate talk events where we can create this momentum of you know climate activism in our country and yeah that's so far what we are trying to do um, through climates nepal and moving um, we continue to do it more and more and we will be possibly sharing more stories to you um, and soon thank you so much for watching Thank you so much, Monica. And next we have Prune as our next speaker, and she is the communication coordinator at Climates, and she'll be presenting us, presenting to us climate stories in France. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me today. It's a great pleasure to be able to meet all my international mates and all the people here. And yeah, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm here today to represent Climate Friends and to like talk about what are our actions. Um, I'd like to remember first that uh, nowadays many young people are suffering from eco-anxiety. As my previous speaker just mentioned, we are really disconnected in like Western, uh, in a northern country from our land, and we are also disconnected from um, other people. So we are suffering from eco-anxiety, and most of the time, uh, young people, um, even if they are willing to act, uh, it can be really hard for them to find a place to express their concerns because, like, we are feeling like maybe older people are not really listening to us and we're not able to yeah, express what we really want to do and we can feel really useless. And actually I believe that climate is um, a solution for that and actually it, had, it has helped me a lot for that. So I'd like to share a bit what we are doing. Um, I'm not gonna present climate because obviously Monica just did and it's the same in France basically. Um, so, our objective, our main objective in Climate Friends is 
to overcome the challenges of climate change. And we have some solutions for that. Uh, first of all, it's like developing and promoting inno innovative actions and tools. So we are like trying to sensitize the public and especially young people and children uh, about how climate change impact, impact their everyday life. Um, then we are also trying to train young people to become actors of change and to influence the decisions maker. Um, so I believe the solution, um, a part of the solution to fight eco-anxiety is to work as a team and uh, to work on a project that, that really matters to us and that enables young people to connect with others and to gain confidence. Um, so, I'd like to present two of the main projects we have done this year at Climate Friends. First of all, we had the local conference of youth. Um, we are really proud of that because it's the first time that we um, organized the local conference. Um, it was like it uh, lasts for one week, uh, one entire weekend, and it gathered more than 350 uh, participants. So, it was like a great time for us. We put the focal points on inclusivity, so our thematic was um, ecology for everyone, and we made sure to include a lot of different topics, so people here could like learn more about ecofeminism, they could learn more about disability, climate displacement, popular education, because we believe everything is linked and we should ask for everyone, everything of this. Um, yeah, we also made sure that uh, we provide di diverse way to sensitize the public because like not everybody is sensitive to the same thing. So we made sure to, imp to include like workshops, uh, to include sc screening debates and uh, also a comic stand and other stuff because um, yeah, we believe we have to touch everyone. So we are mobili mobilizing everything we can. Um, yeah. Um, it was really a re rewarding experience for us because, um, first of all, the organization team was really like only two persons, so they have to do a lot of work and they really um, acquire, acquired a lot of competence by doing this. And I'm really proud of them and I thank them for that. Um, we also create connections with other uh, associations that were there. And it's great because this where associations working on different topics and also with different approaches and we believe that working together on uh, solidarity is like the the key um, and finally what was like maybe our greatest achievement is that we were able to um, to convince many young people to join association some of them are fighting against climate change but not only and we believe that the most important thing uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> but the most important thing is that um, people get involved uh, in a cause that is important for them. We also had the opportunity to meet the French Minister of Ecological Transition and it was a great time for us. As you may know, uh, elections happen in France in um, May and in June we were invited by the, by the French Minister so we had only one week to prepare our speech. It was like really difficult for us but it was also a great challenge and an opportunity to speak to decisions maker about all claims and like to different young people. Um, it was really interesting because we had to build an advocacy really quickly and some of the people in our team they are not really like used to do advocacy so we, we had to write a position paper to coordinate with other NGOs and also to prepare this pitch so this was a great challenge and it also um, yeah, allow us to improve our advocation skills uh, to gain in confidence and to give rise to some vocations so that was a great really great moment and I'd like to end by saying that I believe that together young people can empower themselves and that they are part of the solution and that they can become actors of change. I really truly believe that community is the solution to overcome uh, anxiety and that young people are the key to climate change action. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Prune, for presenting. And now we have our final speaker, Zhang Nan, from Climate China, and she will be sharing with us, sharing with us climate stories in China. Hello 
everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Zhang Nan, a member of Klamis community in China. When I first browsed around on Klamis website, I was first intrigued by the words of the founders of Klamis. It was written in French, so bear with my translation here. Klamis is born from the collision of extreme disappointment and high ambition. I mean, they totally talk to me. This is also the reason why I'm so eager to know what I can do as a youth. If we are crushing the war, which for sure we are going to, I would rather crush at 20 miles than 80 miles. I then saw possibilities in my participation in climate action through climates. This was also the very reason the leader of climates community in China started her journal to empower the climates generation. In 2019, I participated in a simulation of climate negotiation in Shenzhen, China at the International Youth Summit on Energy and Climate Change. The negotiation simulation sounds similar to the model United Nations, but it had more interactive elements and all our inputs were translated into a software called C-Roads, created to MIT Sloan. When we failed to meet the two degree goal, we as developing country representatives were covered by a blue blanket representing the rising sea water and therefore forced to migrate to tables of other countries. Some accepted and some denied. That was a really inspiring moment for everyone. This is classic climate project, Cope in My City, to use a very heuristic for participants with or without science literacy. It was also exciting science education for the combination with zeros was so tastefully complex, and it gave the youth participants the desire to know more about what we could do from the policy level. Climate community in China transplanted the essence of climate. As the leader of community is a beneficiary with no academic background, her, with no academic background herself. She's passionate about recruiting mates of diverse backgrounds. This, is, this community believes in the power of solidarity and public-based effort. Curiosity should be nurtured into the capacity to act Mates in our community are encouraged to seek for the nexus between climate issues and their own academic backgrounds, an interest to keep themselves motivated. In return, climate is a faithful backup for the mates to pursue their goals of climate action academically, no matter what they major in, language studies or fine arts or whatever field. We all live the same world that functions the same way. We want youth to learn more so they won't be waivers and agitated bluntly. We want to make concrete action, or at least be brave to try. We fall and foremost need to be trusted by our peers, regardless the nationality, for both good times and bad. Since the pandemic hit in 2020, we shifted our workshop to Zoom and Google Doc. Our our mates spend the extra months of the winter holiday developing a localized toolkit of flood, flood in Shanghai. This is the starting point of the community in China becoming responsible for their home. We tested our own toolkit with youth aged from 15 to 30, with every test proving our efforts worthy and showing room to improve. Like all mates community around the world, Climate projects are at both international and national scales to keep our youth outside the information cocoon. We have been actively engaged in Sino-French environmental months since the early 2010s in the form of in-person simulation games, webinars, speeches, and youth core. Our community never stops its step to reach out and communi communicate for the greater good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jiangnan. And now we have our last speaker for today, and it is Sola. And she is the Director of Learning and Capacity Building 
at Digital Storyteller and at Climate Kick. And Digital Storyteller empowers a wider community of purpose-driven leaders to harness the power of story and change system for the better. Practical tools were created by Digital Storyteller to contribute to strengthening people-to-people -people linkages worldwide and have been leveraged to deliver more inclusive narratives reflecting the beautiful and authentic world. And EIT Climates, which is another organization that Solar represents, is Europe's leading climate innovation initiative. It creates and connects innovative solutions in in integrated ways and connect stakeholders together to drive climate change actions and to deliver ambitious climate goals. So welcome, Sola. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Sola Sofonestotir, so I understand why you didn't pronounce my last name, because that is a bit of a handful. Um, I am here to do two things. One was to listen to the stories that were being told and the experiences that were being shared. And the other is to connect that to um, a collaboration that Climate Kick Digital Storytellers um, PCCB Network and uh, um, Nishi has ongoing right now. So we are working on um, at, uh, building capability for storytelling and why storytelling. As was so beautifully demonstrated at the beginning of this session, stories are what connect us. Stories are the core part of our humanity, and we believe deeply that in order for shifting our systems, we need to build capability for telling stories. All the research, we are all hardwired for stories. Our emotions, our brains literally light up when we are in the vicinity of stories. They evoke a deep place of connection to us. And as Jack was mentioning before, they are really that place where our hearts connect. Therefore, that ability to really deep to that, to be able to really harness and practice the storytelling space is so incredibly deeply important. So Digital Storytellers has worked on a very simple tool, a story canvas that helps and enables everyone to be able to start building and cultivating their stories. Because we all have this capability, but we need to practice it. And this is essentially a way of uh, creating all the ingredients or taking all the ingredients for your story so that you can bake a beautiful story, a cake, essentially. So the canvas allows you to quickly connect and, um, and work on your idea, either individually or with other people. And just to give a little bit of a flavor, the, the canvas guides you through in terms of helping you understand what is the purpose, why are you telling this story, why, is this, why does this matter and why should other people care about your message. Many people get so caught up in the details of what it is that they're trying to do, but it's important to understand why. What is the bigger purpose that drives you? What is it that belongs in your heart and your gut? What is it that you deeply feel that needs to be communicated? And ultimately, where are you trying to go? Why? What is the change that you're trying to create? Is the, are you trying to increase awareness? Are you trying to call to attention? Or are you trying to shift perspectives? So getting clear on that as well. And then understanding what is it that you would like to get out of it in terms of uh, success? What is the indicators? Is there something measurable that you are really after? Or is it more softer goals? Agreeing upon with whomever you are in, what is the tangible action outcome that you want out of these? And who needs to hear this story? Who is the audience that needs to be listening? Where are they on their journey? Do they know anything about what it is that you are talking to them about? 
Are they engaged? How might you help them take next steps in terms of whatever action that you're calling them for? So having thought about this and reflected about this, the story kind of helps you to bring those items and, and, and reflections together. And the best stories have elements that speak to the head, that speak to the heart, that speak to the hands. In terms of the, hand, the heart, that's really the core element. It's the emotive aspect of your story. It's really usually, usually conveyed through that experience, the lived experience of the person who is speaking. It is the testimonials. It's there where you get that deep to heart to heart connection. And the head refers to maybe some more rational aspects of the story. It, that's where the statistics and data potentially can come in to support what is happening. And the hands refer to what is the action? What is it that you are going to be, what's the approach or the action of whatever it is that you are bringing? So the story canvas helps you bring those things forward as well. The tool is free. You can download the story canvas and start working on it yourself to build your own capability or work with it within your free. It's um, uh, completely online and on Creative Commons, so it's open and accessible to everyone. And I come here with an invitation. As we have seen, and as the message is quite clear, that powerful stories is where we connect. We need all of us to be climate storytellers. Our invitation is to join us or spread the message that it's possible to build capability, unlock your climate story, and join a program that we are starting in, in March 2023. You can pre-register or show interest and then work with us through. This is an absolutely free initiative um, of the PCCB, the Members Network, in, in collaboration with Digital Storytellers, Ichi, Climate and ourselves. And now I would like to just give you a bit of a flavor of a digital story um, that was um, developed at a COP last year. So if I could just get the opportunity to show a quick video. Storytelling plays an important role in the climate action movement. Storytelling humanizes the real world impacts of climate change beyond the data, statistics and graphs. It puts a human face to the bushfires, floods, droughts, variable weather and the people, communities and ecosystems that they affect. Telling, hearing and sharing stories of people's lived experiences with climate change allows us to emotionally engage, to feel, connect and respond to each other more deeply. This in turn encourages us to take practical action and builds meaningful resilience, starting with relationships. Personally, I'm interested in storytelling in the climate space because it creates a much more colorful dimension of climate action, care for our planet and inspiration within our communities. We can see real people making a difference in their own ways that matter within their own sphere of influence. For me, this is much more compelling than media sound bites and catchy grabs from politicians. Vision is not for the future, but one for the now. I hope to see a major shift to the clean economy of visionaries. I hope to see the climate conversation held by more diverse voices that represent people on the climate front line and who are working in a range of roles to respond to our current climate reality. I hope to be a part of more spaces for sharing stories of struggle and success, of challenge and achievement, in all the different ways that climate action is playing out across our economy. We are now into the adaptive phase of responding to climate change. We need to be a bit physical, emotional and system-wide resilience. We need to change the narrative from divisive delay dicks to fierce optimism and intentional action. Storytelling is a great place to drive this shift. So I Thank you. I just want to underline and bold 
and highlight the message. We need everyone to be ready to share their climate story, whoever it is. I think Jeff mentioned before that the disconnection is everywhere. We need to build that bridge between all of us. And the way that we do that is to speak from our hearts. So my invitation to all of us is that we practice. And I would like to ask all of you to think about your climate story and make an attempt to tell it to someone else somewhere here on the halls today. And then please join us. So thank you so much, Sola, and thank you for our amazing panel speakers. I definitely see this as a very insightful session, learning from different perspectives, learning from people from different backgrounds, and learning from different people from different parts of the world. So this kind of brings us to the end of the session, unless anyone in the audience has any questions for our panel, and I'm sure they're very happy to answer your question if there's any. Don't be shy, surely you want to interact with our speakers, so this is your chance if you want to talk to them. We have a question in the back, and I'll just bring a microphone to that gentleman in the back. Hi, thanks so much. My name is David, and I work in Rwanda with the, in the communication space. I wanted to ask about partnerships and how you find best working with different organizations, whether it's government, civil society. In the work that we do in Rwanda, we find that it, you know, when we're working with government or private sector, if we do it alone, we don't really have a big impact. But if we're telling stories together and bringing people on board, then it, we're much more effective. So I'd love to hear, like, what are some examples that you've seen in your own work of how you've used partnership to communicate more effectively? Thank you. So who wants to take this question? Is it? I think Jack yep. Jack, thank you. Yeah, so I'd love to answer from an indigenous perspective. So throughout colonization, there's been this history of paternalism. And paternalism started in the very first days when they took us off our land and then they made sure that we had no access to our traditional food systems. And they gave us the rations that would mean that we would barely survive. And so today, within partnerships, within you know, well-meaning people coming into our communities wanting to help us, this paternalism is still rife in the paradigm, in the mindset of the people coming in. And so me advocating for my cause, the cause that I feel is the solution to climate destabilisation, is empowering Indigenous peoples. And so that is respecting our self-determination. And so that means coming to us and privileging our voices, using your voices within your own privilege, within the status quo that we find ourselves in now, using that voice, leveraging whatever resources you have access to, to ensure that we can undo the wrongs of the past and ensure that we have the best chance of adapting and bringing balance back to this climate destabilization. Because ultimately, that is the answer. It's not about how much energy we can get in a green way. You know, it's not about building hydrogen plants where we're going to 